Welcome back to the Knicks Wall Podcast, presented by Whistle Sports. I'm Mike Cortez. Joining me today, Kyle Maggio, Eli Cohen, Quentin Haynes. So, guys, last time we spoke, R.J. Barrett, new career high. Scott Foster, inept. Emmanuel Quickly. Emmanuel Quickly is finally our starting point guard. So, I don't know, really know where to start. We have the Brooklyn game which was its own mess, beautiful mess, but a mess. And then last night in Philly, and I feel like the reoccurring problem was the same. But um, Kyle, let me jump to you first. Which game stood out to you out of the last two, Philly and Brooklyn? And let's just, what was like the big moments for you? Well, you know, uh, first of all, uh, I'm a little tired on this podcast, guys. I don't know if you could tell, but uh, it's been a long week for us running the RJ Barrett victory lap, uh, just very, very exhausted, uh, from all this, this running because it, it's such a long lap, you know, you have to take, you have to go through these receipts and laugh at all these just idiotic people who thought he was a bad basketball player. Um, uh, so that, that is first and foremost. So congratulations to RJ Barrett uh, for the career high and also for proving us fierce RJ Barrett loyalists on this podcast. Correct. Just want to get that out of the way. Uh, my main thing from the last couple of games to me, uh, they've been fighting like hell. You know, they, they are shorthanded. You know, we can't really forget that. Um, they're they're down, you know, Alfred, obviously. And I know we can make the jokes about that being an improvement, but they're also down Derrick Rose. You know, quickly starting. He's playing a lot of big minutes, uh, which is good, you know, but they're still missing Mitchell Robinson. But they're still in these games. You know, I didn't think they had any business being in that Nets game initially because they had that horrible second quarter with that horrible lineup um, that, you know, Obi looked lost. It was, it was a bad night for him. Bad couple games for him lately. But, um, you know, the, the Frank at point guard thing has kind of gone awry now that he's cooled off. So, you know, that's unfortunate. He's still playing good defense, obviously. That's just, it's, you know, the bad offense is much more noticeable, especially when you can't keep up with the Nets. Um, so I thought that that game was going to get out of hand. They, they came back in the second half. They fought really well. Um, I think I, I I'm angry at the refs. Uh, I think they, they've been really just an embarrassment to the profession the last couple of games, but Knicks blew some chances, uh, in that third quarter, uh, for, sorry, fourth quarter. They had a lot of good looks. They, you know, they, they fought to came back and they did, and they also had a chance to, to pull ahead and, or tie and a couple times and it just, you know, didn't happen, but uh, it is what it is. Sometimes they, they fought Nets are a tough team, even without a Kevin Durant, that's, you know, still two very good all-stars that they got to play right now in Kyrie and James Harden. And those guys are tough, you know, to play. I thought they played good enough defense in those games. Uh, that second half against the Nets was a clinic. It was nuts, uh, full on traps to get the ball back towards the end. Um, and last night I, it was a tough game though. That was a, a slug fest with Philly. An absolute slugfest. I, I thought they were going back and forth, you know, real, real nicely. It was it reminded me of some nice '90s, early 2000s basketball. But um, you know, it stinks that they lost. But you know, RJ had a good look to tie the game. I like that he he's been take. You know, he's got to take big shots. It, he missed, unfortunately. I think he's kind of Kobe mentality, like where it might bother him to try to keep being better because that's just what RJ Barrett does. Um, I don't know. I mean, they they lost, but I'm not like crushed. You know. Yeah, there, it was like a kind of like a – I know moral victories is kind of corny, but at the end of the day, it is literally the top two teams in the East. And the Nets in particular, they gave the Knicks their best punch. It was – they were not taking that easy. Like Kyrie went at RJ. I think he also went at quickly. Harden was Harden. He had, what, 15, 15, 17, 15, and 15 casually. Joe Harris was hitting. So they took the Nets' best punch. It's not like the Nets took that night off. Philly, same thing. Like you said, the defense was back and forth. So these were impressive losses if such a thing exists. Q, I feel like in both instances, the game was cost because 
that second unit really struggled. And the lazy thing to do here is say, well, Manuel Cookie moved up, so now there's no scoring threat in the second unit. What did you see that really caused these problems? Because I feel like in both games, that second quarter run with the second unit really cost them in the end. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just offensively, they just lack penetration and getting to the basket. Like, they really don't have anyone who can kind of create and get to the middle of the floor. So it's just like Alec Burks could do a little bit of it, but he's more of a pop and stop kind of guy. Reggie Bullock, when he's out there sometimes in that second unit, he'll take a couple threes. But I think the bigger issue offensively is there's no movement. So like Derrick Rose would have been able to at least run some pick and roll, but without him there, there's just nothing there. And defensively it's Taj Gibson as talented as he is, as much of a grizzled vet as he is, he's, He's just not the same Taj Gibson. And then if you put Obi Top in near him, it's Obi's lost at this rate. Um, so it's just issues on both sides of the ball makes it difficult for them to get anything going. Yeah, and Eli, I know you were following – You, I believe you did a piece, it was you, that focused on how to utilize Obi or how to optimize him. And I feel like the opposite is being done here. Is, do you think it's time to just – make a move with him, maybe move Knox in, or do you think there's a way to salvage him with the second unit? Because right now it just doesn't seem like it's working. I mean, I think what Q said about he, he he's just – him and Taj is just too small of a front court, especially given his limitations. And, like, we know that Taj can play good positional defense, but he's not – like, he's not a rim protector now. That In his best days, he was, like, more of a grinder than he was, like, a you know, a lockdown rim protector. So – having Nerlens come out of the front or out of the backup unit has kind of hurt him a little bit, even though it does, you'd think that it would actually give him more reps to do, you know, some pick and roll stuff, which we saw like a little bit of Frank and him running a pick and roll. But, you know, the problem with that is, you know, what we've talked about for so long, it's just like Frank isn't that good at running a pick and roll. He, he's a little too timid and he makes his reads a little too slowly. So, I mean, I, I think that there's no reason right now that Knox should be as buried as he is, but I like I get it. You like Tibbs is the guy who has a short rotation and someone's gonna get squeezed out. I think the odds are like when Rose comes back and Alfred's come back, we're not gonna see as much of Frank, which is sad because like he did have a couple like nice defensive possessions. Like not many people can get switched from Kyrie to Harden and back and sort of hold his own. But Obi just has no help out there. Like there, there's no one who can put him into spots that he can get comfortable in. And that hurts. But the other thing that hurts is just, he is so much more raw than we were led to believe. And, you know, he's been a late bloomer at every stage. Like we know that, but I don't know. It, it, it's a little scary to see the 22 year old rookie come in and be as lost out there as Frank was at 19 and as Knox was at 19 and more lost than RJ's ever been. So I, I mean, I think that they can definitely be doing stuff to put him in position to be successful, but he's also just got to have a little confidence. They give him the ball at the three point line. He doesn't even look to the basket. He just kind of swings around and looks for a handoff. And like one of his big things is, you know, he, he's a good passer. He's a pretty good ball handler for his size, but he's not really looking to exploit that ever, it seems like. Um, so part of that is on the coaching staff and part of it is on just like the lineups. But I mean, he's also just, I don't know, he's got to be better. And hopefully with more reps, he will be. But, you know, he's he's just got to be better. He just doesn't look right now like there's anything he can really hang his hat on out there. And that, that's a problem. He's got to find one thing that he can do successfully, and they've got to start using that. He's, like, weirdly timid when he tries to dunk. It's bizarre. Yeah, I, I'm i going to try to pretend that didn't happen last night. I was That was rough. That I was, was rough. more I was mortified, mortified <laughs> for him. I felt – no, I really felt bad, man, because he, like – he cocked it back, I think I, – I, but I don't know what happened after that. He just – He, had, just he had the angle. He had the angle, yeah, and then he just kind of fumbled it a little bit, and he fell – it it hurt, man. I I really felt bad for him. Uh, he he. But I will say, I I did think defensively last night he looked a little bit better. You know, rotation wise, I thought he was on time mostly. I I mean, I'm I'm trying to be fair at least because the offense really isn't there right now. But um, 
you know, that it, it was, you know, at least better from the Nets game. You know, um, I, he's got a lot of work to do still. Uh, I, I don't think they, they help him really offensively. And I think when he's not at least playing with Derrick Rose or, you know, uh, Emmanuel quickly more and, and they're not going to run any pick and rolls for him, then he's going he's gonna to be in trouble the whole year. You know, you, you got to get him on the move. You got to get him downhill. And uh, if not because that's his probably his best attribute offensively, then because that's the easiest way to try to get somebody going again, get them a couple of easy buckets. So um, I, I especially am confused why they haven't done it in this time without Mitchell Robinson when, you know, Noel has been getting some lobs, but he's not uh, as potent a lob threat. And we've seen them do it with Obi, uh, you know, about a month ago. And I'm just confused why they went away from it. You'd think they'd still want to be part of the offensive attack, but, you know, I guess not, uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and I, I think one of the other issues is that, like, a lot of the stuff that you would do to kind of get him into comfortable spots, it, it puts a lot of, like, responsibility on his shoulders. And since he hasn't shown himself to be ready for that kind of responsibility it's hard for like a coach who's so win oriented like Tibbs to actually be willing to put that burden on him like they should ideally be giving him some time to just like grab and go like grab the rebound and bring it up the way that Randall does and the way that you know a lot of their big guys do but like do you trust Obi right now to do that with him looking as lost as he is and if he's just going to be a play finisher then you need guards who can get him into those positions. And Frank's not that guy. Maybe like Rose, Rose genuinely could help that a lot. And I think, you know, in the last two games, we really saw, and I, I can't believe I was saying about how, like, how much they missed him and how much they needed him when the only other point guard option is Frank. But like, like I said, like, unless it's just the play finishing stuff, like the other things he hasn't quite shown himself to be ready to handle, which makes it harder to then give him those reps. So I, I I don't know. It's a, it's a tough thing for Tibbs to balance that. And like the toughest thing for me, at least with watching them, is that I just feel like there's the confidence is the crazy thing. Cause it's, it's in the beginning, it was noticeable, but he was like, it's the, it's a rookie trying to figure himself out. Now it's just like, it's almost like he doesn't have any confidence. Like this is someone who at Dayton was doing, high fly dunks, making key three pointers and stuff like that. And this guy, like he doesn't have anything right now. And I don't know what the cure is. Like, it's almost like the Knicks need to blow somebody out. And then Obi just plays the entire fourth quarter and just runs pick and roll like five times and get some dunks and get some easy looks. He just kind of needs something. He needs a win right now. And I just don't know if they're going to get that at any point. And I also think the issue is, is that Tibbs just doesn't trust him. So it's just like any time he goes out there, any mistakes he makes, he's quickly out the game. With, once everyone gets healthy, Taj Gibson is going to be an easy replacement for him in that in that mold. I just I just don't know when we get to see Obi get a win here and actually get back on track. So that's the concerning part for me. Yeah. Um, it it look it's it stinks, but. Um... I will say, at least in the last couple of games, you know, um, I thought quickly, mostly he looked pretty good. Um, I thought he shot a lot in the Nets game. I thought he needed to shoot a lot in the Nets game because they needed a, a gun in there to try to keep up. And I thought it's the right idea. That's what that's what he's on this team for. And he's, he's got to be shooting a lot. And I didn't mind because a lot of them were threes. Now, some of them were fours. Some of them were a little bit... Uh, early he was trying to just try to rush him but more or less I like that he was hunting the threes I like that he was trying to get his his clean looks and I, I thought you know he just missed a couple and I, I thought more or less that's encouraging stuff um, I thought the the offense was more well spaced I think uh, our you know you know especially like last night when RJ the first time they, they went up with Ben it, it felt like he was just obviously in Rikers, but he also had, you know, less room to operate and uh, felt like last night, you know, part of the reason RJ was able to get, be successful is because he had more room to kind of roam. It felt like he was kind of getting to where he wanted to pretty easily. And for a guy like RJ, as much as he's improved this year it, in a lot of aspects, he still sometimes has difficulty kind of getting specifically to where he wants to in the paint. Um, you know, he's been better of course, but 
I just thought it was more noticeable last night. He was getting a lot of good looks. Seems like he was very patient, you know, especially with uh, Ben last night. But um, either way, just quickly has been encouraging to me last couple of nights. Um, so I, I don't I, Everybody gets carried away, I think, with the playmaking stuff, which I, it makes I, I no sense to me. I, I Yes, of course, you would like to see any of your starting point guards get, you know, four to five assists. I do at, at least. I understand. Like, that's the minimum that you typically would want. But in this instance, when so much of the offense runs through Randall first and foremost, and then if he can't get it or off of Randall's play, whatever it is that he's doing, a lot of the times it gets funneled right to RJ. And then RJ is that secondary guy, as he should be. So the fact that those guys make so many decisions for where the ball is going to go and how much they, they actively play, uh, play, make and pass. I, yeah, like it'd be, it'd be cool if, if quickly also was doing that, but at the same time, when he's playing with two, you know, kind of very good distributors, there's no reason for him to be doing that. He, at that point, he's just a, he's a scoring guard. And in 2021, there's nothing really wrong with that. There's, you know, a lot of teams that are sort of built that way where their their guard is maybe primarily the the main assist guy, but he's got to fill it up. You know, Sexton's a decent, he's done better this year playmaking, but Sexton was a good example of that too, where he's just kind of, he's going to light you up and then they're going to figure it out other, other ways with unselfish players. So I, I don't know that he needs to, you know, we need to worry about that with him so much. Yeah, I'd like to see it go up, but either way, like he, he did what he's supposed to be doing with just scoring, spacing the floor, shooting those threes. Right, and RJ is going to eventually have that responsibility, but quickly has the ability to be a spot-up shooter if he needs to be. He could self-create. I feel like his best shot is off the dribble anyway, so I don't have a problem with him shooting that much. The last two games, they needed it. If you look at the Nets, who contributed, it was Randall, RJ, quickly, and then I think the next leading score, I mean, the next highest score was Bullock at 17, and then after that, it was single digits, so... It was situational. It's not like he was bringing the ball up, not looking for anybody and just launching away. He was doing it because there was really no other option. So I think as Rose comes back and he starts to get in a groove with the start, I think you'll start to f- see him, you know, find guys in their spots when he is already doing a decent job at that. The starters haven't looked as stagnant as I thought they would, honestly, because I thought it would be a little adjustment period. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I, th- I thought it was really stark in that last game when Tibbs took – Tibbs had RJ out, like, on the bench until, like, what, four or five minutes in and then went uh, left in the game. And then when he brought him back in, he took him – he took quickly out to play RJ, Bullock, and Burks, which is something he's been experimenting with a little bit more. And just the the absolute grind that the offense turned into at that point – was so noticeable, like the, the way that the offense just completely stopped moving, stopped zipping around once quickly left the game. Like to your guys' point, like he, he's not yet a point guard. He is just kind of a scorer out there right now. But he, what he does kind of energizes the team in ways that sort of, I, I don't know, it kind of replicates what a point guard's impact would have, especially when Randall and RJ are taking so much playmaking duty. So like, while I do like that Tibbs is experimenting with RJ at the point, cause we've been, you know, we've been talking about that on this pod for like a year now, but like the, the, the just, I, I thought that was maybe the biggest and most costly mistake of the game was like, instead of bringing RJ in for one of Burks or Bullock to take out quickly. Like you just really saw how everything kind of ground to a halt just because like Bullock can't really put the ball on the floor. Burks can, but he has complete tunnel vision. Like, except for that one little feed to Taj, he's not looking to get people involved. He's just looking to get to the elbow and take a little jumper. So I think that despite him not really having those point guard instincts honed yet, which I think he can learn how to do. And he's got some nice, like float, like lob instincts, but having him out there, just kind of having his gravity and his ball movement just energizes the whole team. And it really does kind of function in similar ways to what, you know, he, it would be like to just have a normal functional point guard out there. Not that we can really imagine what that's like since we've had elf for the last two years. It's just a nice change of pace to have, a point guard that makes the defense panic, whether it's him pulling up from deep, him getting by you for a floater, him just duping you into a foul. We saw him trigger DeAndre. It was pretty funny where he was, he just kept duping him with this silly little move. And then he hits a three from deep and then he hits a floater. So he 
puts pressure on defense that's just non-existent otherwise. He he kind of you know does, but uh, you know I was watching uh, the, this video we did on whistle where where Gilbert Arenas is talking about how Damian Lillard likes to open up the defense, and he says you know Dame likes to come out and shoot a couple of really deep threes. And he does that initially because you already know that he can do it, but now he wants to scare you very quickly into playing up on him. And then as soon as you start doing that, now he can kind of control how the game is going to go, you know, versus the de- you know, playing into whatever the defense is doing. And I thought that was, you know, a, a good point because that's kind of what I lo- we, we want quickly to do. We want him to come out, hunt a couple of those threes, hit a couple, and then it's like, ah, shit, we got to get out there. We, we can't. We can't leave him at, you know, 27, 30 feet. You know, he's gunning. He's just, he's just gunning. He's, he's killing us. We, we got to get out there. And then he's so fast that he's going to dupe you with those fouls. Like DeAndre is closing out on him. And then, bam, I got you. I'm going to run into you. I'm going to get you again. I'm, I'm shooting these free throws. And if not, he's going to get by you anyway because he was going to blow by DeAndre. So that's, that's an element of the offense we haven't had from, like, really any point guard in quite some time. You know, like even Derrick Rose, back when we had him, his best trait at that time was he could still get to the rim and score. You know, that that's just what he's always been able to do. But shooting has always been suspect for him. He's been better later in his career with it, but at that time, not as, you know, not as much. And it's like, when is the last time we had a guy who was just going to scare you this much, 30 feet out, getting to the rim? Like, it, it's it's really okay that he's not a playmaker. Like good players just do what their team needs them to do. It's not about fitting a certain role. If you got two really good playmakers, one of them's an all-star, one of them's a a legitimate star on the rise here in RJ. Like it's okay to just play off those guys. They'll, they'll do the work. You just got to hit those shots. That's, that's it. And that's okay. There's multiple ways to build a team. So right now from what you, what you guys have seen from Quigley and what you think he can, be down the line is he someone that you would want to start next year considering that we might make the playoffs and we might have larger expectations is that someone that you want to start or do you think you would consider an upgrade over him do you just want to throw him out there into the deep end next year or is that an area the Knicks should look to upgrade I think I would start him I mean we're going to talk about Lonzo a little bit but if you just add you Quickly is versatile in the sense that you can add a defensive minded or three and D type point guard like Alonzo Ball. You can add a high level score. You could add Victor Oladipo and shift quickly to point guard. So he could do a little bit of both. So I see no reason why he should find his way out of the starting lineup. And the furthest I would want to see him fall is six man, where he's playing like Lou Will type six man minutes, where he's still leading the team in like top five in minutes on the team. So he's a de facto starter. But I think his versatility and everything we mentioned warrants him at least getting that initial run as a starter. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like, I I think in an ideal world, he's probably not starting at the one. You probably have whether, you know, consolidating to move up in the draft or just some kind of free agent or trade move. You probably get someone and you let him play the two. But I don't see any reason right now to think that he should not be starting next year, like barring some huge drop off or some huge addition of talent. Like I, I think there's, you've seen everything you want to see out of like a modern kind of combo guard from mm-hmm. him. So I, yeah, just let him keep cooking. Yeah. I, I think, you know, letting him start is fine. I think you should always consider an upgrade though. Like, I, I think he's dynamic enough where if you need him to play off ball, he can do that. And I think if you need him just to play the point a little bit more, he can. And lest we forget, too, point I remember just now, he was doing more playmaking when Mitchell Robinson was here. I know we forget this because he's been gone a month, but there were a lot of times earlier in the season when Mitch was healthy, when Quick was just lobbing it up to him instead of floating it because they were going to take the floater away. So then Mitch was just rolling to the rim and bang, it's another lob. Like that was happening a lot. Like it's been difficult with Noel. Again, he's not as much of a threat that way. So I think people for, are forgetting that too. Like he he did have more, you know, higher assist total games back then because that, that was an easy connection that he had at that time. I think you could start him. There, there's There's no downside to that to me. Yeah, I, I was just curious because, you know, we're getting closer and closer to the trade deadline and free agency, and there's some interesting names. And 
I, I think the Knicks should allocate all their resources to the backcourt. Um, is just depending on how much they value quickly moving forward. I think I, I ultimately agree with Kyle where everything should be on the table in terms of potential upgrades and everything, but it'll be interesting to see how the Knicks handle that because they're not necessarily giving him all of the point guard minutes. Maybe they give him the backup. Maybe they trade off for Peyton and just give him those minutes, but we'll see. It'll be interesting to see how much they value him in, you know, when they come to free agency. I think he'll he's safely in the top five. Like if you put like a value chart of this team right now, I would say Randall and RJ are the only untouchables at one, two, RJ probably one Randall two. And then you probably got into like quickly or Mitch at that point at three and four. So. I yeah. Think- I think, you, I think something would have to go wrong if he wasn't in Tibbs' circle next year and he wasn't in the top five or six in minutes from the game. Something would have to go wrong. He got hurt. Knock on wood. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Exactly. So I like even if they add somebody in the draft, even if they sign a point guard, I, I pretty I feel confident saying Emmanuel quickly is going to be a big part of this team. Either way. But um, we're going to take a quick break in a second. But I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the end of that Brooklyn game. Julius Randle had his Nick moment, I would say, well, on court Nick moment when he dropped 44. But this one hit different. I don't know. It was I know it was going after Scott Foster, who nobody likes, so it's an easy target. But I don't know. I felt like Randall earned a lot more of his stripes that night. I don't know why. Maybe it was just the passion. Maybe it was just the whole, the culmination of the night where the game felt like it was out of reach. And then he led the comeback along with RJ and quickly and kind of just grinded that out. I mean, the two consecutive jump balls, the missed calls by the refs, and then finally missing it again. When I want to start there, Kyle, did you think that was the travel? Because while it is clear, I feel like it was still very gray just a call in general and what could have done i don't think it was a travel i i I very much disagree with what the nba said um they said the ball wasn't dislodged i i think we have different definitions of dislodged dislodged to me doesn't mean randall has to totally lose the ball i i thought dislodged simply meant like out of his control and i thought it was clear that the ball was out of his control when you see the ball going up a certain way in his hands and then you clearly see after the block he doesn't really have it it's still just kind of going up with him but it's not really in his hands and then by the time he gets it again he's not in a position to shoot and he's sort of on his way down so he decides i got i'm going to put the ball down the ball was loose for a second so to me it was he got blocked and then the ball just happened to kind of be still – it wasn't a hard block. The, it just, you know, fell into his hands. So I, I don't know. I, I disagree with the call. I don't, I don't think that was a travel. Like, it, it, was, it was a clear contact by Kyrie to make a play on the ball, and he did hit the ball, and it, it clearly affected the trajectory of the ball in his hands. Uh, I will harp on it. I don't normally harp on the stuff with the refs. I'd never get on this podcast and complain we lost a game because of the refs or anything like that. Uh, we didn't get enough free throws versus the other. I hate doing that. You know, every game is different. Some games we're going to have more, you know. But to me, that was just a, a really bad call. And, and at worst, then maybe it's a jump ball. You know, I I, I don't know. But to me, the, blowing the whistle, giving the nets, the, I, I, I didn't like that. I, I didn't understand it, and I disagree. Yeah, and that was just one of many calls. They had the call where I think it was – RJ that shot it. I don't know. It was it involved Joe Harris, and either he touched or didn't touch. I can't remember now. But that was a blatant missed call. ESPN cut from that replay so swiftly. Then there was the hard and travel that RJ eventually blocked. Then there was the two jump balls, the initially called a foul, and then a travel. So it was just a shit show towards the end. But Randall earned major points with me. I mean, it was good to see him pissed off. And he earned his stripes. Yeah, it was. It was different, like I said. It hit different, where he felt like now it's like this is my captain type of vibe, you know? We love knowing guys care. We love knowing that you care. We love knowing that you care that much, that we were all also that angry at home at that time. And then he was also more angry, which is tough to be when when we're talking about Knicks fans. So that was very exciting to see. It was very relatable. 
Uh, it struck a nerve with all of us for the most part. So, you know, shout out Julius as always, uh, always holding it down. Uh, we, we, we appreciate the energy, my guy. Yeah. And now the next thing is to get him some help. And on that note, we'll pick it up on the other side. All right, we're back. And as we left off, Randall needs help. Last two games, he's given it his all. And in the Philly game, you could tell he grinded because in Brooklyn, he had to play 41 minutes. So many minutes. It's like, it was insane. And he had to do it because the Brooklyn game specifically, that second unit literally looked like the JV squad was facing the varsity. Frank was just farting all over the place on offense. Reggie was just doing other things. It was, it was bad. (laughs) <laughs> the game, I'm pretty sure the Nets took like a 14-point lead in that quick span. It was alarming. So Randall had to play all the Brooklyn game. Still almost won. Philly, he comes out blazing. For the first three quarters, it looked like he was going to carry us to victory. Fourth quarter comes, tired legs show up. I mean, that's just what happens. He's a human being after all, which I was asking myself – by the half of the Philly game, I was like, how does this guy have this much energy? But I feel like him, and if it's not him, it's RJ, that have to really carry this team night in and night out. And the bigger problem with this is Thibodeau doesn't really split them up. He keeps the starters with the starters for the most part. He's deciding to play Reggie with the second unit. And Q, I want to toss it to you because you wrote a good piece on it a few weeks ago about playing, splitting up. Randall and RJ, and that doesn't mean trading them. It means literally staggering them, kind of like what the Nets did. You saw when Kyrie came out, Harden was right there to carry the load, and it's like there was no drop-off. So it looks like Thibodeau could and should do that with RJ, but Q, take it from there. Yeah, I really think one of the bigger – one of the biggest things that the Knicks need to do is figure out if RJ Baird is a legitimate offensive weapon they can kind of lean on in different lineups and one of the things I just wanted was remove Randall let RJ play vice versa and I I thought you saw some of the positives in that Brooklyn game especially in that fourth quarter where Randall was out RJ was in with the bench and he was getting to the basket there was one play where he was coming off the he was coming off the side and he went for a little pump fake got DeAndre Jordan in the air got a quick layup then came back and like pressed DeAndre Jordan, pushed him back a bit and got an easy layup at the rim. I just want to see if RJ can kind of hold those lineups together, even for small stretches, because if he, if he's able to do that without Julius on the floor, you just have another analog offensively. I think a lot of the fan base wants to have the conversation of that. They need a quote unquote one, number one score or another top score I think RJ could be that guy. You just kind of have to put him in position where he gets the reps to do it. And then you bring Julius back in, then you can try to get both of them shots. So really my proposal in that piece was just let RJ get some extra minutes with the bench and let him carry the offensive unit. I think they're okay if they lose some of those minutes out there, because I feel like if you bring Randall back in, you can kind of win the back. So more of a development thing from my side of just getting RJ to ball and let's see if he can be that number one score. Yeah. I mean, I think especially true when, when quickly is coming off of the bench, which I think we have to assume that once Peyton and Rose come back, he'll probably coming up, be coming off the bench at least a little bit. But when that's the case, they, they get a lot of shooters out there, which is perfect for, for what RJ needs to really just like become that kind of hub and work on it. Like, some of his drives and kicks the last few games have been, you know, some of his most impressive playmaking. So I think like if you can get him in a lineup where you have, you know, like quickly and Burks and, you know, Rose takes up a lot of the possessions, but, you know, even Obi or Knox out there, like he's got a lot of options to play make. And so he can kind of get those looks of like, you know, basically taking on the Julius Randall role. Like, like Randall is like right now, Last year, we complained all the time about how Randall and RJ, their flaws overlap too much. Now it seems like, you know, RJ should be looking to Randall and saying, okay, I can do all those things, right? Like, I, I'm, he's not as big, but he's just as strong for his position. He can definitely get to those places. And I think he's becoming more patient and he's picking his spots a lot better, which is, you know, really the other than his shot coming along is the most encouraging thing about him. So I think if you can just put him with quickly and I really think that like 
you know, I, I can't believe I'm saying this after last year, but like getting Knox, just like putting Knox in the corner where he's one of the most, you know, he's one of the most consistent corner three point shooters in the league right now. Um, you could really watch him kind of come alive even more as a playmaker, which is really what they need to kind of take him to that next level. Yeah. I, I really think that Knox, Knox would be a perfect fit. You know, I think in the piece I wrote specifically a little bit more about Obi getting that just because I feel like RJ can kind of create a little bit more for Obi, but certainly not Knox is another option there just to get a to get a little bit more spacing and a little bit more stretching on the floor. Yeah, and no, I, I mostly agree with uh, you know, that point even about looking to Randall, um, for RJ to kind of start to kind of build his game like because weirdly they work well together this year. So I don't think it can hurt. You know, I'm assuming I'm operating under the assumption that Randall's going to be here a while because I I would like to think the Knicks aren't going to fumble this one. I, I don't know how or when I would just like that he stay and be here long term. And I'm going to assume that he will. But um, I, I think RJ will, too, uh, assuming they don't move him. And I think them, you know, having multiple guys who are that unselfish is very good. So it helps their games not be that clunky. It helps them, you know, learn where they're going to be in space and how to, you know, cut at the right time and and they've really built that chemistry up so um yeah i think rj just got to keep doing what he's doing i I think his his playmaking maybe it's not as prolific but he always just makes good smart passes he's a very 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 intelligent basketball player and um i i just like a lot like last night i i i just like the way that he he adjusts from game to game and opponent to opponent like he got his butt kicked when he played the Sixers last time. And last night you go out and you see him like, you know, picking his spots better. And, you know, I, I like that he had the freedom to kind of feel like the top option at times when he came back out a little bit with like the bench unit. And um, I, I think he should be empowered in those situations. I think right now he'll, you know, maybe, maybe get him a couple more games like that without Rose or Alfred around. But um, I think they should try to do it more. I think they got to stagger him. I, I think it's the best way. Uh, you know, we see all the good teams do that with their stars a little bit. And, you know, the Knicks, they're a good team. They're a good team. And I think that's how they become a better team. It's just, it's, you know, it, it's fine if you want to play them in, in most of their minutes together because they're going to already play most of the entire game. There's plenty of time to stagger them. Like, I, I think there's plenty of time, to, you know, to kind of get cute with the lineups and have, you know, RJ be the main gun and give them a couple different looks and, you know, why not play RJ off the bench with Obi? RJ loves throwing to guys who are the lob threats. He finds Noel. He's the only one who finds Noel right now. He always finds Mitch. You know, why not let RJ play with Obi off the bench? You know, like it, it could help Obi's game too. So I, I, there's a lot of benefits to it. There's a lot of benefits at least to experimenting. And when you're shorthanded, it's the perfect time to do so. So hope to see a lot of it in the short term. And, uh, you know, especially like Q said too, when, when Randall's going to play his minutes alone, like you could win back those minutes. He does everything. He does everything. He finds whoever's open. He finds, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're going to be in the plus when Randall's out there. So, you know, I have, you know, be, be creative. Yeah. I just don't like Tibbs with all these hockey lineups. Just be, it. feel free to be creative, man. You could change it up a little bit. Yeah. And to your point with, we're talking about RJ getting reps as down the stretch. I feel like, those minutes with the second unit kind of serves the same point where you're the focal point, you're the focus of, of the lineup most of the time. And that's really not the case. He's usually always sharing the floor at Randall. So he's always second fiddle. I think, you know, getting some reps, and it doesn't have to be a long stretch, but, you know, get some minutes. I think just getting a slasher with that second unit would have changed completely, like completely different game if you have a slasher. And obviously Rose helps, but even with Rose there, RJ can be a much – I feel like Rose at this point is not going to get you what RJ can get you if RJ gets going. This is only tangentially related, but I, I just had to say that one move he had last night against Simmons where he okay. got like – Simmons? He got, yeah. Yeah, he got caught up under the paint and like Pride looked him. like he had no idea where he was going and then came back strong with the right hand. That was one of my favorite Perfect. moves I think I've ever seen him do. That was beautiful. Cooked. He's getting so damn crafty around the basket and Once so his- patient. Once his shooting touch catches up with his IQ, he's going to be really, really good. Wiggle Twitter is sick right now. Sick to their stomachs at seeing him finesse around the rim. <laughs> I, I, I can't. 
I can't grasp people that were really tried to shit on him. And he's how could you play. not I mean, look at his episode. game and see a smart basketball player? I don't understand. Even with the inefficiency, I did not understand for the life of me that people were convinced he was like this horrific player. Like I, it, like what games were these people watching? It, it will always bother me. To this day, it will bother me. Yeah, it's uh, either way. The victory lap has been very fun, and his adjustments in game, like the Nets again, he he struggled in the first half. Second half back, player, second, second half player. Literally, I tweeted out during the game. I was like, he's gonna come by. He'll be fine for a second half. And sure enough, who was there with Randall down the stretch? It was RJ. And then same thing. He was facing Simmons, who was probably defensive player of the year right now. And he still managed, I mean, albeit less than 20 points for the first time in a while. But, you know, 17 out of, I mean, it was a low scoring game. Take that into account. But the point is he started to find his shots against good defenders. These aren't slouches. Like, okay, see the new career high. Okay. I was happy about it, but it was still a rudderless roster to. What was the, what was the other good Staff for him with the he's holding opponents to forty percent shooting over the last four or five games. Yeah, yeah. So he's doing it on both ends too. I mean, it's everything we expected. In addition to being a good defender, because I didn't think he was going to be as good a defender as he is now. I feel like no one talks about him being really good defensively. I don't know why, but I think that's probably the point of his game. That's probably the most underrated to me is that like he's probably another off season away from being like a legitimate wing defender who the Knicks could lean on a little bit. You know, that's why I, I'm actually curious to see who they draw in the playoffs if they make it. Cause if you got to guard Zach Levine in the, in the play in series, or you got to play Jimmy Butler, like those are additional reps that are going to be huge for him. And it's just going to be, you know, him on the main stage, getting a shot to defend one of the better wings in the league. And I think that's something that he's up for. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, no, we we shall see. He's got to get more reps as a top gun, but uh, very encouraged. I think he's going to be a two way tear uh, next year for sure. Um, you know, he he's already if he closes the year, you know, on on this surge, he's going to be, you know, pushing what eighteen, nineteen points a game. You know, yep. he's he's already what what is he averaging rebounds wise six or seven, you know, three four assists like. You throw in the defense, and now now we've we're we're on to something. You know what I mean? If that's only year two and three, I mean, the sky's the limit. After that, uh, then it's just about where he go. You know, at 21, 22 years old. I mean, how do you how do you beat that? Well, what more could you want? I mean, right. I, I, I I I can I can go on for days with this RJ stuff. So I'm gonna gonna stop here. No, and the best part about it is you can really add whatever player you need. For the most part, I would say. Like, there's not really any type of player you can, like, star player I'm talking about that the Knicks can approach or, you know, just have interest in that I'll say, ah, he's not really a good fit with RJ. I can't really think of any off the top of my head. But I do think this team does need help because all that, all that we've said has still left us to one point where the Knicks clearly just need that extra scoring punch. And I don't think while Derrick Rose will help, in the playoffs, they really need somebody that can score in the half court. And I don't know who's scoring in the half court consistently aside from Julius and RJ because that Philly game was a good example of what a playoff game will look like. And we saw in the fourth quarter, points were really hard to come by. And not even factoring entire legs, there just weren't many easy shots early on. So that takes us towards the deadline. Deadline's coming up. Q, you wrote a piece on, I believe it was, was it last month? It was Monday on some wing players, because I think that's where the upgrade needs to happen because that wing rotation is pretty thin. After Reggie gets pretty thin, what were some targets that you think they, they should be interested in and what should they really be looking at? So one of the players I was more interested in was Troy Brown Jr. from Washington. He's currently out of the rotation. I just think that he's a he's a he's a cheap gamble. He has a year left to control before he hits restricted free agency. So I was just thinking that because he's a decent playmaker, he can probably be like a creator in the second line second lineup. The the second unit. The idea of thinking Alec Burks is 30, maybe this is Alec Burks or someone who can be like Alec Burks at 21, 22. Um my pie in the sky guy was Kevin Herter 
from Atlanta. Atlanta's playing really well right now, but I feel like Atlanta's stuck in the middle between trying to appease all their young players and trying to play all their uh, free agent additions. So they have the John Collins situation to figure out. I don't think they would take Obi and one of our first round picks this year for Kevin Herter, but I would call and see. I think Kevin Herter would be a perfect fit on the Knicks. He secretly improved a little bit on def- defense as well. So it's not like you're getting the all shoot, no defense type of guy. You're probably getting someone who can be just an average defender. Um, those are the two guys I was interested in. I also threw in Evan Fournier, um, Josh Hart. Josh Hart averaging like nine rebounds per 36 minutes. He's an interesting guy to me. Um, there's a Ultimately, I want them to get a, a wing player who has a maybe a year or two of control left just because we're going to enter this free agency period and the only wing player they have on the on the docket is R.J. Barrett. And I do think that is a bit of concern considering the way the NBA plays. So I did mention Lonzo and I did mention your piece in, in there as well, but I kind of focused on Kevin Herter and Troy Brown Jr., to be honest. Herter would be perfect. That's probably my favorite out of the names you mentioned. And Lonzo, as you mentioned, I wrote about it as well. He's on the Knicks' radar. Mark Berman, New York Post, mentioned it that he's that Lonzo Ball is on top of Leon Rose's list of targets in free agency. And likewise, Lonzo is rumored to have the Knicks high on his list. So this is trending towards speculation that will intensify as the offseason comes because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm reading this wrong, the way he's playing, really, I don't think you can really trade for him, right? Is there a trade package you think works for Lonzo right now? I don't I don't think so. I think the Pelicans probably want like a big piece. So at that point, you're probably not talking RJ. You're probably not talking Randall. I can see them wanting Quigley back in a trade just because I feel like one of their issues is that they, they need defense and they need shooting around Zion. I don't think I would put Quigley in a trade for someone who's going to be a free agent in like three months. So once you once you put Quigley off the board, I just don't see the exact fit there. Right, and Lonzo, the rumor is the Pelicans do like what they've seen from Lonzo, but they're also not likely to match any contract that exceeds, I think it was 18 mil annually. So if you are going to go after him and restrict the free agency, start your bidding at like 19, which still isn't bad. That's Tim Hardaway, Julius Randle range. Kyle, would you pay that price for Lonzo? Because I feel like that would dictate if you wait or not. Because if you're going to overpay him, I feel like you wait. If you don't think he has value or you think you value him more than the rest of the league does, I feel like you can make a trade and then get his restricted free agent rights and just sit back and match any offer sheet. I would like to say that we can go get him. I don't think a trade is realistic at this point. I think if they were going to act, uh, they should have acted earlier in the year. I, you know, this is why uh, I always push being aggressive with this team because I I just feel like, you know, if you got, if you got a good idea, you should just go for it. Don't, you know, don't overthink things. Don't try to get too cute. But I guess the report is that we'd be high on his uh, restricted free agency list of, of destinations or, or whatever it was that Berman put out today. And uh, I would just try to throw the money at him and, and make the Pelicans match they have ingram you know who's already you know what isn't he on his max deal they have zion who's you know going to be entering year three and they're going to want to pay up for him obviously he's going to get the max so i mean how far the the pelicans really going to be willing to go on him i'd be willing to wait at this point um it's not really even so much about the assets i feel like you could probably figure out something that could work uh, where it wouldn't kill the Knicks too, too much, uh, given just what they have to work with. But um, it, like Mike said, if you're going to overpay, I, I would just try to wait for it, you know, and, and see if the Pelicans balk. It didn't feel like they believed in them all that much, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, maybe they, they've done a 180 or they're, they're super in and I, I'm, I'm just speculative, but I don't know. But, you know, call their bluff. Yeah, they've also got a lot of money in Steven Adams. So I don't think that having a lot of money in Steven Adams would preclude them from, you know, retaining Lonzo, but it does become a question of how much are they willing to spend before they even get to Zion's, you know, you assume he's going to get some kind of gigantic max contract. 
I, I'm with with Key where I, I don't really think that they can even make an offer. Like the only thing I can honestly think of is if they included Mitch. And I, I don't really see that because they've got Jackson Hayes, who's just sort of like a worse version of the same Mitch archetype. But like 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 they're they're not gonna trade someone who's playing as well as Lonzo is and who I think it's worth mentioning fits Ingram and Zion like pick or like even like like you know Obi and Frank and a pick like they're they're gonna want something back that can win with Zion now and can be a big piece moving forward and I just I just don't really think the Knicks have that to offer unless they're willing to put Mitch on the table and then you know New Orleans is just trading one restricted free agent for another so I, I think that Kyle is right I think that with Lonzo specifically I think you got to just wait until free agency and, and see just how far you can push New Orleans before they balk. Yeah, I think that's the push to take. And I do like the fit with Lonzo. I think we've covered it before, but I feel like at the very, very worst, he's giving you a much more than Alfred Payton or any other guard that not named Emmanuel quickly on this roster. And especially if he's shooting well, I, I think this is a no brainer and I feel like in hindsight, they should have went a little harder for LaMelo in the draft. And I think Lonzo is still a guy who can kind of like quickly where he can either be on the ball or off the ball just because he can do other things and great passer either with the ball or if he's playing off the ball. So I think he fits well. But you did mention Mitch, and I feel like he would be available. I feel like he is available. I don't know if I'm reading too much into these Andre Drummond rumors, but – it sounds like Mitch is available, guys. I, I mean, someone's got to be. If they're supposed to be aggressive and, and looking for, you know, big upgrades, which, you know, everything always points to the perimeter for them, whether that's another guard or wing, you know, they're supposed to be looking for somebody high level for that. And if you're to believe that RJ is untouchable and Randall is untouchable, like the Knicks would like to lead you to believe, then – yeah, Mitchell Robinson's got to be available, right? I mean, that's the only – I mean, unless you're going to sell on quickly, which it doesn't feel like that's something that they would do with how high up he is. And, and you know, he, he's now very well regarded uh, in terms of the national media. Um, everybody's rookie ladder has him in, you know, the top three generally in some order. So I, I think, yeah, it's it, – who's available for them seems sort of obvious. It seems like they'd make Mitch available. Um, you know, they'd probably make Obi available. And I, again, I, people talk about Obi not having a lot of interest, but uh, I, I, I don't know. I, it, it does feel like Mitch is probably the starting point for where the Knicks would want to start. Cause I'm sure they don't want to include, you know, those other guys that I had just mentioned. I don't think Mitch being available bothers me that much in hindsight. At first I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe they're really not going to, sign another draft pick but I guess what bothered me more is Andre Drummond the Andre Drummond rumor because that just makes no sense to me in any level I feel like it's just a steroid version of Nerlens if that he doesn't really add much that Mitch doesn't already do it just didn't make any sense to me so if and that was the move I think I'd be very pissed off but then I heard Miles Turner that kind of fits more of like, okay, you're at least going towards more guy that could shoot and still offer rim protection next to Julius. So that was a little smart. So maybe they're just getting tired of Mitch's lack of offense. I, I don't know. Eli, what do you, what do you think on that? What do you think's the problem with Mitch or perceived problem? Honestly, I just think that this is all just like due diligence. I don't really think that there's a problem. I think that, my guess is that they're just, they're looking to retain him, but they're looking to see if upgrades are possible, which is what any good front office should do. Drummond, I think it, it seems pretty clear at this point that that's sort of more coming from his side than it is from the Knicks side. A reason it keeps getting leaked other than Berman's weird obsession with him. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a bromance. It's a bromance for sure. Um but like the Turner thing, I think makes some sense. I think that like I agree when people say that like the idea of what Turner brings is probably greater than what he actually brings. But at, at the end of the day, I think that what it is is, is just you've got a guy who is 
semi-proven in Mitch. Like he, he's proven that he's good, but it's kind of unclear how good this is his first season being a full-time starter and he's approaching restricted free agency. So, you know, you do what a good front office does and you just, you poke around and you see what's out there. And I think that in the end of the day, like, like if they were going to trade him, they trade up in the trade him to move up in the draft to get like a top Turner would be super happy about, but I would like, I would understand it and I'd be willing to give it a shot. But I, I really just think that, that it's that more than any kind of discontent with Mitch himself. My only, if I could jump in, my only issue is just, I don't understand how they value Mitch at the moment, because I honestly think that they should just extend his contract and then figure it out. I honestly think they're trying to find someone who can shoot a little bit at five position just to open up a little bit more spacing. And that's, and that's fine, but it feels like they're chasing it rather than allowing it to come to them. Like, I feel like you can go and grab somebody and take a shot. Like Aaron Baines, I believe he's a free agent this upcoming year. He hasn't been great for Toronto, but for three, $4 million, you could take a punt and hope he returns to what he was in Phoenix. You know, I'm sure there's some, seven foot guy who's shooting a bunch of threes coming out in the draft you have three picks try to figure it out I'm sure there's someone overseas who can shoot threes like I just think there are better ways to spend your money and use your resources than chase a center who can shoot a little bit and I just don't understand what they're looking at with with Mitch because I just feel like he's not going to get a lot of money I feel like at the moment the the big the rim running big man is kind of devalued so you should be able to get him on like 450, 455. And if you have to move that contract, you can move it a year from now. Yeah. I just, I'm just not comfortable, even if it's drum inside leaking those rumors, I'm still not comfortable with the fact that the Knicks are attached to big men. I mostly agree with you. Um, I definitely agree about the Drummond thing. Um, 100%. It makes no sense to me. Turner... I, I agree about the centers. I, I don't like that they're still chasing centers. Turner, I understand if you aren't attached to Mitch and you go, okay, who, you know, that one I buy as a, as a Knicks target, like a legitimate one that's been reported because he fits the defensive profile of what they want because he's still, you know, the best, isn't he the best shot blocker in the league right now? So he he's always tops in that. He's a good defender. So I'm sure that they think, okay, well, at least he would fit in our defensive system. And then offensively, we're not making enough threes. He could shoot. So I, I, I can understand again, you know, like Eli said, the idea of him is probably better than the fit, but I understand that idea, but I would also just prefer that you focus on perimeter targets. It's painfully apparent. Anytime we get good guard play, good things happen. So I would prefer that that's where the focus lies. Yeah. But, um, I, I mean, are there any, other trade I targets? Agree. Yeah, oh. I agree with you on that. When we discuss this, all, when we eventually start doing the offseason podcast, it, it should be focused on perimeter players. I don't want to discuss centers. Just bring back Mitch, find an adequate backup, even though well if you want, and just go from there. Well, what about one center? I got to pitch this because I pitched it in Slack earlier. Now I can't stop thinking about it. If you from Mitch, I got a name, and he is a center. Mm hmm. It's unrealistic, but I think it also is realistic in the size of the package the Knicks could really offer. Carl Anthony Towns. Now, hear me out. I know D'Angelo Russell got traded there to appease Towns. They suck. They absolutely suck, and I can't really see what's going to change for them rapidly. I feel like they are what they are. Even Anthony Edwards is already scoring 30 points. I think a change of scenery is eventually going to come. I feel like Mitch, Obi and just any pick, any and any pick, the Timberwolves want for Towns. What are your thoughts? Mike, your, your optimism never ceases to impress me. <laughs> I, I, it genuinely brings joy to my heart for <laughs> someone who's as tired and cynical as I am. Uh, I, I love to see it. I, I think the only way I, you could see that even being remotely a possibility, and I, I want to say remotely is the key word here because I really just don't think if someone could do it, I don't think it's the Knicks who could. The only way I could see it happening is 
if the Wolves miss out, if they lose their pick to the Warriors this year, then things get tricky because they have a lot of money tied up and they wouldn't be getting that first round pick after being like the worst team in the league. Then maybe you, you know, Towns looks around and says, well, how are we going to not be the worst team in the league? I want out of here. But like, I mean, I think it would be, it would be Mitch. It'd be Obi. It'd be quickly. It'd be anyone and everyone. Like I, I really think, and even then I, there's just so many teams that they like, what's stopping OKC from swooping in with just like, here, we'll give you 25 first round picks <laughs> yeah. and take your pick of anyone not named Shea Gilgis Alexander and give me cat. You know, I, like I, I would love it. It'd be incredible. I just, I can't bring myself to even consider it as a real possibility. Just Wes being in the background of this would give me confidence because it seems like anything he wants, he will at least get the Knicks to do their best to get. And I just want to point out, Carl Anthony Towns' Twitter location is wherever Big Blue Nation takes him. The Knicks are pretty much Kentucky grad school at this point. So I'm not saying the signs. I mean, the signs are there. I am going to say it. The signs are there. He's from the area. I think it would be great. And I think he fits perfectly with what Julius Randle and RJ can do. I think he can shoot and does everything. And that would be the star player that they've been looking to get. I feel like that's the next available guy that's going to come up because I can't, I don't think Beal is going to go anywhere. I really don't. And I don't see another star becoming disgruntled as quickly as I think the town situation is going to get. I mean, I would hope he gets upset and I would hope that the wolves are dumb enough to accept a trade with us. That isn't great. You know, I, I mean, it can't hurt to offer it. You know, we got enough picks to make them listen. Kevin Knox and two gotta... first. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah. Too much? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. Too much. Too much, of course. No, but I, I think if you're like, hey, man, we're starting it at three unprotected first round picks. But also, you have to be interested in OB Toppin. I think you get in the room. You got to listen if we're offering three picks. I think you Who just got to start there against? and be like, look, I'm just, I don't, I'm not saying they're going to accept it, of course, but when you're offering that many picks, you, you have a conversation on your hands. So it's, I, I don't know if you do it for Towns right now, but it, that that's that's a that's a good swing. If we're gonna go with the center, I really go for the center. Just go get him. It is what it is. But I, I don't know about that. It's gonna be tough this to is, get him. I don't think I, he's gonna be available yeah. for another year or two, if anything. You guys are gonna hate me, but you know where he should actually go. You know who should make that grandfather. I was about to ask offer. who's you know, gonna I, beat them. It's the Pelicans. Mm -hmm. give them every pick they got from LA every one of their own picks that's already like 10 picks of their own Jackson Hayes every single person who's not Zion and Ingram give them Lonzo whatever and just build around Zion uh, like baby Shaq and the best shooting big man in the league that I would watch yeah but the Pelicans are reportedly the whole thing even what Lonzo is they don't they're like squeamish about this luxury tax and I think Zion Cat and Ingram puts them right at the limit so i don't know i mean uh, they definitely have more assets i'm not going to argue there but i feel like the knicks have the willingness to do it the assets to do it and like i said when we talked about the harden trade what team are you more willing to bet against screwing something up than the knicks <laughs> maybe the wolves the wolves are probably like the only team i could think of ahead of them that you know like okay the chance of them botching this anyway and us getting great picks is very high. So let's just do this deal. Sacramento. I'm sorry. Sac okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say Sacramento, Minnesota. And now you get to, like, the Knicks. Yeah, I, I feel like that's a – point is, I feel like those picks add an extra value just of reputation. Yeah, especially if you put, like, the 2023 pick in. Because, like, RJ will still be a restricted free agent, but Julius hasn't signed anything yet. So – if a team was looking to spin the dice, that 2023 Knicks pick might be interesting to them. Yeah, I think that – is that the draft that also includes high school kids? Is Whenever that draft starts, I feel like it's going to – I feel like draft pick value is going to drastically change. I think it's either that one or the year before, 2022 or 2023. Huh, we'll see. But I guess we'll get answers closer to the deadline. The deadline is – 
March 25th. In the meantime, the Knicks will look to get off their little two-game losing skid. Orlando is coming to the Garden when you're probably listening to this podcast on Thursday night. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see if RJ can continue his run of scoring. We could see if Randall is still limitless in energy. And please, for the love of God, can Frank Nielakina score a basket for me? Because his defense is so damn good. We need to keep him out there. But Frank, four games already. Let's let's get off the schneid, buddy. But uh, I'm good. Anything else to you guys? Anything to plug? I'm going to be doing a um, one burning question for each Nick going into the last 30 games of the season. That should be out on Friday. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Mm. Uh, yeah, we got a bunch of different content coming <laughs> in the near future here. Um, I think we're, I think I'm writing something about Emmanuel Quigley and, event, you know, grabbing the point guard position. So hopefully he can play well so I can write positive things. Kyle, any top shot purchases on the horizon? Any uh, anything to plug? Uh, no, nothing. I'm I'm sitting tight on that rare pack I got. That that's that's all I gotta say. Uh, it worked out for me, so I'm I'm feeling pretty fortunate, even if I missed out on the last couple. But make sure you're checking the nickswall.com. Uh, make sure you're buying the t-shirts, designtree.com slash the nickswall. Uh, and just keep you know we got the 32k. Shout out you guys following us on Twitter, and uh, that's it. Keep following, keep supporting, give us a nice rating on uh, iTunes. We'd appreciate that. Helps us keep doing this, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Take it easy. Top, top shot. Show us some love. Top yes. shot. Sponsor Show the pod. Send the some pack. Some <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for joining me. Right. Take it easy. Take it easy.